Pastor is always your pastor, and he was um, he was a little nervous this morning. 
And so he texted to find out, <laughs> make sure I was here, and uh, informed me that they're, he and Sherry are having a <clears throat> great time, uh, really enjoying the, the gospel music festival. And uh, also I, I told him that I'd do my best not to mess it up so that he, wouldn't, he could come back and not have a, a mess to clean up. So uh, it's, a, it's amazing to me how, how God causes all things to work together for good. Because um, the Lord, in His own mysterious way, shined a spotlight upon you. And you and your pastor demonstrated what it is to know the Lord Jesus and be committed to Him. And that's been a blessing to me as I've prayed with you and for you, but, but I've seen how God has used you. So I want to express my gratefulness to the Lord because I know He's the one that really is responsible and should get the credit, but I want to thank you for being faithful in your commitment to Him. Amen. As I thought about, <clears throat> let me tell you this, when I preach, I don't preach to you. I preach to me. I figure you're as messed up as I am, and so it'll just kind of overflow. And if you're not, then begin to pray for those of us who are, and uh, thank the Lord you're not that messed up. <laughs> but I want to I wanna focus this morning on Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And as you find that scripture, I'd, I'd ask you to stand in honor, if you're able, to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I'm not sure which translation you have, but I'm going to read, uh, I think this is the New King James, but I'm not even really sure of that, but it's, it's close enough. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high, and lifted up. And the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. I'm thankful that your word says it never returns unto you void, but accomplishes the purpose with which you've sent it forth. Lord, I claim that promise today in my own life. I want you to do in and through me exactly what you desire. And I pray, Father, that my answer to you right now is yes. No matter what you ask, what you speak to me, that I will say yes, Lord, yes. I pray that for all of us. We're here, Lord, not by accident, but because we know that you're God. And we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Let me ask you this question this morning. Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful? Now the truth is, we live in a culture where it's difficult to be hopeful. As a nation, we seem to have lost virtually all civility in our language and in our actions. Our national sense of right and wrong tends to focus on what folks consider tolerant and fair. But interestingly, we only tolerate those who agree with us. 
Now, that's both dis disappointing and discouraging, if you ask me. And we see divisiveness like we've never seen it before, at least not in my lifetime. And I'm in my 75th year, so I've been around a while. But I've never seen divisiveness like this. So much so that our politicians can't seem to make any decisions today. Now, the reason I bring that up is because our situation is very closely akin to that which Isaiah faced in this particular chapter. Isaiah was a young man. And he, he, he went to the temple in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah had been king in Israel for 52 years. That's a long time. And in that 52 years, they'd had a golden age. Ever, the economy was doing well. And they had been victorious on the battlefield. There were no threats. But in the last years of his life, idolatry began to raise its ugly head in the land. And there was this nation called Assyria, which was beginning to ascend in power and threaten the people. Their hope had been placed in their king, and now he was dead. So probably similar to those of us who remember 9-11, what happened after that, we were unsettled. And where did we go? Well, we flocked to churches by the masses. Now, we didn't stay there long, but we were unsure. We weren't hopeful. We were discomforted. And so we went to seek a word from the Lord. That's, that's what Isaiah did. He went to the temple to find comfort. Now, chaos and crises often bring us to a time of reflection, self-examination, and even prayer. So what did Isaiah, what happened to Isaiah when he went to the temple? I mean, was it temple as usual? No, it wasn't temple as usual. It wasn't just rituals. It wasn't just going through the motions because the Bible says that Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. Now, did that affect him? Yeah, yeah the Bible leads us to believe that he was awestruck by the holiness of of God. Well, the truth is, he needed to see God. I'm convinced if there's ever been a time in my life and in the life of our nation, we need to see the Lord. You see, Isaiah had placed so much trust and confidence in the visible king that he now needed to reach out to the invisible king. He had tended to take life for granted. Do you have the same problem? Sort of Day after day, it keeps going on. You sort of think you got it under control. Things are going sort of the way. It sometimes gets a little off, but, but not so much that it so dissettles you that you need to see the Lord. Isaiah needed to see the Lord. He no longer could find security in the things of the world. He needed to find his place in relationship to God. So what did he see? First thing he did, he saw God in all his majesty. The Bible says that he was high and lifted up. So his reaction to the visible presence of God really is like if you read throughout the Bible, anytime somebody saw the Lord, they basically were awestruck. They usually fell on their face. You can see it in the life of Ezekiel, Daniel. Uh, you can see it on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. Certainly in the book of Revelation when uh, John the Revelator saw the Lord. Struck down when we see the Lord, when we realize who God is, we've sung the songs. But so often it just becomes words. When we really know who God is and we realize His power and presence, it strikes us down. We're not the same. We find both a sense of awe and also a, a fear, if you will, a reverential fear. He saw God in all His power and glory. The earth is full of His glory. That, that's what these weird creatures were singing. And uh, the Bible it ter uh, uh, translates it seraphim, but it really means fiery creatures. There, there were three of them. And they're flying around, covering feet, covering face, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. Now, that's what's called worship. And uh, so seldom do we really sense an attitude of worship. We, we kind of go through the motions because we don't really appreciate who God is. And God 
He is an awesome, um, didn't we just sing it? He is an awesome God. I, I, Chris, I appreciate you. I, I, the Lord must have been working together in this somehow. Amen. Amazing what the Spirit can do. We need to realize that the worship of God really doesn't start at 11 o'clock or 11.15. It's an ongoing experience. And the Lord doesn't need your church, the church at the country church. He doesn't need our churches in order to receive worship. Because today, exactly what Isaiah saw is going on. His whole creation is worshiping. He doesn't depend on our worship. He's not focused upon our style of worship. God's not up there saying, man, I hope they sing some hymns today. I hope they do a few contemporary songs. I really need to hear that. That's, he doesn't need that. That's more about us, isn't it? Than about the Lord. I mean, can you imagine this morning if we saw a little bit of what Isaiah saw? I mean, first place we wouldn't see God, we'd just see the hem of His garment filling this place, smoke and thunder and lightning, and then these weird, fiery creatures flying around with an antiphonal effect. Where there's, this one's a holy, holy, and holy, holy, and it's, it's just, it's an amazing thing. I tell you what, there'd be a few of us jumping pews, and we haven't jumped in a long time. Because that's what worship looks like. The whole earth is full of the glory of God. Now, God is worshipped not because He needs it, but because He is God. He created everything that there is. He spoke, and it came into being. So in some way, shape, or form right now, His creation is echoing genuine praise to Him. I tried to, I tried to really cause myself, as I was thinking about this, to visualize God. He is the galactic God. The whole universe is His unrivaled symphony. Uh, this morning in, in Bible study, uh, Brother Mike was telling us about, uh, he, he doesn't sing very well and he doesn't sit near anybody because when he sings, it throws him off key. But you know what? The Lord's not going, man, I, I really hope Mike can sing well today. Because if he doesn't, he's going to mess up the whole thing. The Lord's not saying that. He's not doing that. In fact, the Bible says make a joyful noise to the Lord. It ought to flow from our innermost being because He is an awesome God. He's a great God. He is God. And His universe is praising Him with resounding worship. In fact, Jesus said, if we don't praise and worship Him, the very rocks will cry. I want the rocks to shut up when I'm around because I want to be the voice that magnifies and exalts the living God. Isaiah saw the Lord and was awestruck by His holiness, His differentness. He's not like you and me. And folks, we need to have a new vision of the living God to throw us and break us out of our doldrums and help us to understand it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Him. And He is an awesome God. Second thing, Isaiah not only saw the Lord, he saw himself. And what did he do? He said, well, you know, I'm not so bad. Is that what he said? No, he said, I am ruined. I am undone. He confessed his own sinfulness. Here's what bothers me. Our standard today for goodness is subjective and relative. And it's a flawed standard. You know what we do? We basically look around and we see other folks and we say, compared to him, I'm not so bad. I'm pretty good. And so we try to make ourselves feel good in our sin by comparing ourselves to other sinners. I was thinking about this. You know, um, pastors, uh, we're paid to be good. Y'all are just good for nothing. <laughs> See, God's standard... For goodness is not subjective, it's not relative, it's absolute. There is right and there's wrong. And though we color a lot of that gray, God doesn't color any of it gray. And God gave us His law so that we could see what holiness is like. 
Now, did he do that to make us feel bad, to make us feel unworthy? No. He did that so we would know that the only hope we have for righteousness is in him, not in ourselves. And so his, his standard is absolute. His, his commandments are a mirror that when we look into, we see how sinful we are. We understand, I don't have it made. I don't have it all together. I'm like Isaiah. Woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm undone in the presence of God. I need some help. I need some help. Now, as I was thinking about that, um, I, think it was, I think it was Mike also was talking about David this morning. When are you talking about David? Because Psalm 29 is where we were in Sunday school. By the way, you guys need to be coming to Sunday school. Not only you get a breakfast, but then you get dessert with a good Bible study. So, Anyway, he was talking about Psalm 29, talking about David. Now, was David perfect? No. He had a heart like God. But you know, he messed up pretty bad. And Nathan, the prophet, his preacher, confronted him. And as soon as he did, David didn't try to rationalize or justify or excuse his sin. He confessed his sin. He wrote a song about it, Psalm 51. Keep your finger in Isaiah chapter 6. By the way, I hope you have your Bibles open, because it doesn't make a whole lot of difference what I say. It makes all the difference what God's Word says. So keep your finger in, in Isaiah 6 and flip over to, to Psalm 51. Because in Psalm 51, the first two or three verses, what David does is he basically expresses his sinfulness. And he uses three words there for sin. Now, I, I really, for a long time, thought that what David was doing was he was using Hebrew poetry. When we have poetry, how, what do we do? We have a certain beat, and we, ha, we rhyme words, right? And so that's our poetry. The Hebrews didn't do that. The Jews didn't do that. What they did is they rhymed thoughts. Pretty smart on God's part, because... Hebrew poetry translates into every language because the rhyme is not in the word sounds, but is in the thoughts. So if you read uh, Proverbs or even Psalms, you'll read one line, and the next line either says almost the same thing, or it'll say the opposite, Hebrew poetry. I thought that's what I, uh, David was doing in Psalm 51 because he uses the word sin, the word transgression, and the word iniquity. Y'all see those there? Th those words. But what David was doing was he was summarizing every way in which you and I can sin because he was guilty of them just like we are. First word he used, or I want to use, is the word sin. That comes from the battlefield. It basically expresses what an archer does. You, you, any of you bow hunters? Some bow hunters? Okay. Every time, that's David, right? Every time you pull the bow back, you hit the center of the bullseye every time, right? No. <laughs> Shocking. No, and nobody else does either. But guess what his intention is? His intention is to do what? Hit the center of the bullseye. So his intentions are good, but he misses the mark. Sometimes we want to justify our action. Well, I intended to do well. That's irrelevant. If you miss the mark, you sin. That's the word that's there. And so David says, I want you to do what with my sin? Wash it away, is that what it says? Then he uses the word, I want to use the word transgression. Now transgression comes from the agrarian area, from, from agriculture. And it really deals with cows. Now I was reared on a dairy farm in Arkansas, so I hate cows. I mean, I was greatly blessed when I was able to go to the Naval Academy in Annapolis and leave the dairy barn, wanting no part of it. I don't like cows to this day, unless they're about that thick, about that big around and cook, cook medium. That's the way I like my cows today. But my responsibility as a young person was to take care of the heifers. You know what a heifer is? That's a cow that's never had a calf. And so you got to raise them up. And uh, heifers are, are really weird creatures because they won't lead, they won't drive, they're stubborn. The word transgression comes from the Hebrew word meaning stubborn heifer. My, my responsibility was to feed them. I, I, you know, I was in Arkansas, I was barefoot sometimes, and, and an old uh, heifer would put her hoof on my foot, twist, and smile at me. <laughs> hated them. Still hate them. 
still have that problem back there. But you know what? There are a bunch of us who are stubborn heifers. We don't care what God says. We don't care what the preacher says. We don't care what the law says. We're going to do whatever we want to, and particularly in our country today, because we got our rights, and so I have my right to sin, and nobody can tell me otherwise. That's a stubborn heifer. That's a sin. Transgression is the word that we translate. The third word is the word iniquity. Iniquity also comes from the pasture, but not from the cattle, from the sheep. And it literally means, it comes from the word that literally means nibbling astray. And so the idea is this, a sheep are supposed to do what? Follow the shepherd, exactly right. Where he leads me, you know, green pasture, still waters. But here's the picture. And I, I suppose, I don't, have, I don't have anything to do with sheep, never plan to learn about them, but I, apparently the sheep are grazing as the shepherd's leading, and there's this one sheep back there. He's not looking at the shepherd. Right there is a real luscious patch of grass. One step. And so he nibbles over here. But you know, instead of looking back up to the shepherd, right there, guess what's right there? Another luscious patch of grass. And so he nibbles. Well, before long, what has he done? Nibbled astray. Now, did you ever wonder why at some point in your life you became a pervert? Iniquity? I mean, we all have. Normally, we associate that with some sort of sexual deviancy. Listen, anytime you stray from where God wants you to be, you are perverted. And we've all been there. So don't look at me so piously. I know. I've been there too. How did we get there? One day we wake up and say, you know, I think I'll be a pervert today. <laughs> no. We what? Astray. Nibble astray. One little step that doesn't seem so big, but you add up all the little steps and you've taken a giant leap into perversity. Those three words are what David used. When Isaiah saw the Lord, you know what he saw? He saw how he's missed the mark in his best intentions. He saw how he's been stubborn and done things that people had told him and God had told him he shouldn't do. And he recognized how he had nibbled astray and walked away from the Lord. And he said, woe is me, for I am undone. That's called confessing sinfulness. The greatest need that we have in our church today. And Mike, who works in church health, uh, church revitalization, the greatest need we have in our church today is repentance. Nobody wants to repent anymore. We want to excuse and justify and rationalize what we're doing. It's not all that bad. Everybody else is doing it. But when we do that, all we do is condone our sinfulness. We need to see the Lord. We need to recognize our sinfulness and cry out, woe is me. By the way, how do we measure up before the holy God? I mean, if we were in Isaiah's place, would we have the same response? Of course we would. In Romans chapter 3, the Bible says, There is none righteous. No. It's going to take all day if y'all don't help me. No. Not one, for there is all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we're all in the same boat. But the Bible also says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful, righteous, just to do what? Not only forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see... When we're in Christ, we're no longer... He, God didn't see us as sinners. We're covered by His blood. He sees us as if we had never sinned. I, I can't even imagine that. But that's what God's grace and mercy does in our lives. And that ought to make us excited enough to be uh, shouting and jumping and leaping and praising. But often we just take it for granted. We've heard it so long that we just kind of put it in to that catalog of theological truths that don't really impact our life. Now, after Isaiah recognized his sinfulness, one of these weird creatures makes a flying dart down to the altar, which is, there's a fire there. He's got some tongs. He grabs a coal and he starts toward Isaiah. 
Now, what do you think Isaiah thought was going to happen? He thought he's going to be incinerated because he knew he needed to be or deserved to be. But instead of incineration, there was transformation. And that weird creature says, your sin is purged. You are forgiven. That has to, you know, do you remember the first time you confessed Jesus? When you actually said, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you forgive me and save me? Do you remember what that was like? Do you remember the burden that was pulled from your shoulder? The burden of my soul has, what's the song? Washed away. Exactly. I think we've sung that too this morning, Chris, didn't we? No, we didn't. What was the first song we sang? Washed, uh, washed away. I thought so. Yeah, we, we got there. Good job, by the way, all the way around. You remember that? Remember how God had cleansed you? Listen, when that happened to me, I was ready to charge hell with a water pistol. I mean, I, I, could, I realized what God had done for me. I want everybody to know that. That seems to be Isaiah's position because then the Lord asked a rhetorical question. You know what a rhetorical question is? That's where you ask a question and don't really expect an answer. Preachers do that all the time. In fact, you really want to mess a preacher up. When he asks a rhetorical question, answer it out loud. I mean, it'll so discombobulate him, he won't know where he is. And so God says, who will go for us? Isaiah immediately responded, what? Here am I. Here am I, send me. Send me. Listen, if you want to thrill your pastor, you respond that, in those kinds of ways to what this church ought to be doing. Here am I, send me. Yeah, there, there, he didn't foot shuffle. Isaiah didn't shuffle his feet. He said, well, let me go home and pray about it. All that is is an excuse for not doing anything. When you know the Lord is speaking and you know the Spirit speaking to your heart, there's one response. Yes, Lord. Yeah, here I am. What? Send me. Now, in, in his question, you know, you notice God didn't minimize, He didn't excuse, he didn't, uh, minim, he didn't deny, He didn't do anything but about Isaiah's sinfulness but provide a means of forgiveness. Today, you can rationalize. You, you can try to convince the Lord that you're sin in sin. God doesn't care. He's provided a means for you to be forgiven just the way you are. That's what the blood of the cross is all about. And we see that exemplified in Isaiah's life. Isaiah, in responding to the Lord, here am I, send me, he had already seen his people. Remember, he said, I'm a person of unclean lips. I live in a culture of unclean lips. Here am I, send me. He knew that God wanted him to at least be a voice, an instrument of righteousness among his own people. Now the interesting thing to me is God immediately, you got verse 9 and following you throw up back there. Look at look in Isaiah 6 and go down to verse 9. What was going to be the people's response to this powerful message that God was going to give Isaiah? What was it going to be? Well, they're not going to listen. They're not going to respond. You're going to be a voice crying in the wilderness. Your, your voice is going to fall on deaf ears. So Isaiah was warned ahead of time that they would not respond as they should. But you know what? It doesn't matter what people do. We are called to be faithful in serving the Lord. It took me a while to figure this out. I pastored in, on the north side of Houston for 17 years in a church there. Sunday nights and Monday mornings were miserable for me because no matter what happened on Sunday morning, it wasn't what I hoped would happen. Sometimes there was no movement. There was seemingly no impression of the people by the Word of God. And I'd go home and I would second guess. Now, maybe I shouldn't have preached that message. Oh, I must have done it wrong. Finally, God convinced me, look, it's not about you, boy. It's about 
me and my word. So you just be faithful. Go do whatever I tell you to do and leave the results to me. Don't, don't be wanting things to happen so you can break your arm, patting yourself on the back. It's not about you. You know what? That was the most freeing revelation I've ever had. For example, this morning, I don't care what you do. It's not my business. It's between you and the Lord. You'll answer for that. I won't. If I have been faithful in delivering His Word, I can go home rejoicing in the Lord, seeing the Lord high and lifted up, because I will have been faithful. So uh, my, whole, my whole ministry life has been changed. If I am faithful, the rest, re the rest of it lies with the Lord. So uh, God, did, God didn't, He wanted to know they're not going to respond. But that's not the issue. The issue is you deliver the Word and let the Word fall and His Word is powerful. It does things that we can never do on our own. The other thing here is God sent His people the message not because they wanted to hear it, but because they needed it. Folks, you and I need the Word of God today because in His Word there's power. In His Word there's forgiveness, there's salvation, there's purpose because there's a relationship with the living God. And all we have to do is say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I guarantee you this, because He loved you and me so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die on a cross, when we confess, He is quick to forgive and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I began this morning talking about how the chaos and uncertainty in the world has a tendency to tap down our hopeless, our hopefulness. We're hopeless in many cases. But here's the good news. God is still on the throne. He has not stepped down. He has not given His authority to anybody else. And if you doubt it, just look around and look up. You see, He's closer than you can ever imagine. I, 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 was, I may have been Mike. Somebody prayed this morning and said, Lord, thank you that where two or three are gathered together, there you are in the midst. So He's not only here in the hearts of those of us who have been born again, but He is blessing us with His presence. If we, like Elijah, could see with the eyes of the Lord, we would see angels all around. We would see the mighty God present in our midst today. And it would change our hearts. It would change our lives. And that's what I pray. I pray, Lord, help us to see you in some fashion in the way that Isaiah sought you. And if you've never had that experience, there's this song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. In Jesus, you find hope. In Jesus, you find peace. In Jesus, you find purpose. And in Jesus you find life, eternal life, life that's more abundant. So as a man that's tasted of the goodness of the Lord, I extend to you today the opportunity to have that same power and presence in your life. And may God bless us. Would you stand as we pray? We're going to conclude our service with a time of invitation. I don't know how God has spoken to you, but I know He has because He's spoken to me. I don't know what you ought to do. If you've never trusted Jesus, if you're still dealing with your sin and you want to be forgiven, this morning during the invitation, you come. I promise you that the Lord will do in your life what you never imagined. If you are a believer, but you know you've nibbled astray or you've been stubborn, this is a great time to repent and say, Lord, here am I. I am undone. And the same words that God gave to Isaiah will give you. You are forgiven in Christ Jesus. Or if you need to be a part, and God's leading you to be a part of this church, this is a great time to make that decision because God is starting to move powerfully here in Sutherland Springs. As God has spoken to you, I'm going to pray. And then Pat, Brother Mike, be down here. And uh, I want you to respond. Do what Jesus is calling you to do. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what, I, what happened to Isaiah. Thank you, Lord, that the same experience can be true in our lives. And I pray, Father, that right now your spirit will have his way. 
Father, I ban the old evil one right now from being able to confuse, to distort, to do anything. I pray that he be rebuked and, and cast away from our presence so that we might do business with you, the true and the living God. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, what are we going to sing, Chris? Nothing but, the blood. Nothing but the blood. Good. As we sing that, I encourage you, as God has spoken to you, to respond. Let's sing and let's do what God's calling us to do. Pat? Let's pray. All right. Father, we thank you for all that you do and all that you're going to do in our lives. So I pray now you can dismiss us. Lord, as we go our ways, help us to go knowing that we have been sent by you on mission. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.